Now, one of the wonders of astronomy is the gorgeous pretty pictures. And here's a typical random gorgeous pretty picture taken by the Cassini spacecraft showing Saturn, and that's actually Earth in the background over there. And these things are lovely. Now, is this what all astronomical images like? This is what the images you take are like? I wish my images looked like this. This is more about what an image that I take looks like. So this is a picture of a random piece of sky. And what you see here is this modeled pattern. And that's because the sky is full of random photons that are arriving from things we just can't see or just from the atmosphere. And then I'm going to be interested in something really, really faint, not something like that but more like something like that, right? And so that isn't much. And so there's only a few extra photons arriving above the background. You're often be looking at things where you only pick up you know, a few photons an hour from them. And you're going to get, over the same time, hundreds of photons from sky emission, from zodiacal light and other stuff. And it's all going to be a random arrival. Photons, let's say you're expecting 10 photons a, um, a minute. It doesn't mean every one arrives regularly. Um, in practice, it's random. It's like buses. Maybe five arrive at once, you get none for an hour, which is what produces this whole modeling pattern. And what this means is that when you try and measure how bright something is, you're not going to get it precisely right, no matter how good your telescope is. It might be that, for example, you're going to have an error of plus or minus 10 photons. Yep. Now, let's imagine you've got a whole bunch of things at different redshifts, and the nearby ones are going to be bright, um, have a high this is log flux here, and the far away ones are going to be faint. Now, this one, you might be getting a million photons from your object, so an uncertainty of plus or minus 10 photons on a million is going to give you almost no uncertainty. But as you get fainter and fainter, these ones you might end up getting you know, one photon an hour. In that case, a 10 photon uncertainty is going to give you serious grief. So That's your right. errors are going to go up and up and up as you get fainter and fainter and fainter. And this is pretty much inevitable. It's the very nature of how the observations work. So this is what the error bars look like. So let's say you did a sample and you did measured hundreds and hundreds of these could be Cepheids or supernovae or something like that. So it's you've done like, like a Monte Carlo, what we would say. You've gone through and you've taken the uncertainty and you've just randomly created something with that uncertainty. That's right. And it would look something like this. So they'd be pretty tightly clustered up here and spread out. Right. So this is all well and good, but we're going to have a problem here, of course, because when we actually go out and look at the sky... I only see things to a certain brightness. That is, yeah. I, I don't get to get all of the, you know, I, I don't get yeah. to see everything here because I can't tell they actually exist at some point. You know, if you could see all these ones, the ones that were up here and the ones that are down there, clearly if you only had three or four data points that could randomly be up here and they could give you grief. But if you could do a sample of thousands of these things, in principle you could average your way through the middle of all these things and get a line, something like that. Yeah. But as Brian said, we're not going to see all of them because um, let's say you've got a, a, a ten, ele 10 photons worth of noise, something that only picked up 10 photons is probably not real. Yeah, well, it's just a, it's sort of a, it's a two and three chance that it isn't real. Uh, if you think every part of the sky has got a 50-50 chance of being real. Yeah, so you probably need to be something up around maybe 30 or 50 electrons, uh, photons. Uh, I could be electrons because every photon that hits produces an electron in your... Mm -hmm in your detector, so you'd need to be you know, three or five times the noise level before you're really confident things are real. Otherwise, you're just going to get swamped by just random statistical fluctuations. So let's say this is our cutoff here. We've decided that that's the faintest we can go and believe it. So we're not going to believe anything below there. And that means you're going to lose all of these objects that are yeah. too faint. If you tried to count them, you'd get these, but you'd also get a million other spurious ones. Right. So it's really very, you can't count these things no matter what you want to do. And that means what you're actually going to see is something that looks like this. Yeah, so you're gonna, correlation you're going to find is going to curve up. So what we're trying to do is measure, if you think about what we're trying to do as a function of redshift, we want to measure the relative flux of an object back in time, but we're going to be getting the wrong answer right where we're interested in the information, where what the universe is doing counts. Yeah, and these ones are going to appear brighter than they should be because you've lost all the faint ones, and because they're brighter, we'll think they're nearer. So that will curve our entire... Um, curve of scale factor versus time and give us the wrong answer. Right, and you may think, okay, what we need to do is just build a bigger telescope and see the bright ones. So if I get a bigger telescope, one could imagine shrinking this to even larger redshifts. But there's another effect we have to worry about that's a little more subtle, which is that the objects themselves are not perfect. They're not all the same brightness. They're brighter than average and they're fainter than average. And so the brighter than average ones, we can see over a bigger volume of the universe. 
And so even with a big telescope, what we end up seeing at the edge of our sample, even if we cut it off for bright objects only, is we always see the brighter than average objects. And they always end up biasing our result unless we fix that problem. I saw an interesting example of this with some of my thesis work. We went and did a survey of a thousand quasars, and then five years later I went back and reobserved 50 of them to see how much their brightness had changed, because quasars change in brightness all the time. And of that 50, every single one had got fainter. Mm. You'd kind of imagine you know, half would have gone up and half would have gone down, but every single one went fainter. What's happening here? Well, of course, our original survey had a flux limit, and so we're likely to catch the ones that were at the brightest stage because at that point, there are intrinsically far more faint ones than bright ones. So you're far more likely to catch a faint one that happens to have been bright than an even brighter one that happened to have been faint, because there are just far more of the faint ones out there. Yeah, and you see them over that huge volume when they're bright, and a very tiny volume when they're faint. And so, yeah, that's a normal selection effect we have to worry about. Well, could you just ignore the ones near the limit of your survey, just deal with the ones that are not hard to spot where you know, there's oodles of brightness? You, you cannot get rid of this problem because there's always this effect of things coming in and out. And it turns out the better your distance method, the smaller the scatter is intrinsically, that makes things better. It turns out by the square of how good a distance indicator you have. So if you have something like Tully Fisher we talked about that has an 18% scatter and a Type 1A supernova that's 6% scatter, as a factor of three difference, it turns out the effect is nine times worse for Tully Fisher, the square of their relative differences. Could you model this whole thing, actually do a Monte Carlo simulation like this and try and estimate how big the effect is and therefore correct for it somehow? That's exactly what we do. And if you use a method like Type 1A supernovae that have small intrinsic scatter, then you can probably model things out to a few percent. Uh, but when you have a bigger problem, then the problems get nine times worse, for example. And then instead of being a couple percent, they become 18 percent, which is probably bigger than you want. Okay, so we've talked through the classical way of measuring distances, the classical distance ladder. So we start off with parallaxes, main sequence fitting, Cepheid variables, Tully, Fisher, supernovae, each of their problems, and as well as the problems each of them have, some of which we understand, some of which we don't understand. There's the problem of dust and the problems of these sorts of biases coming in. I mean, this sounds pretty hopeless. Do we just give up? Well, it is a reason why that, you know, for almost 100 years, the measurement of especially the Hubble constant, where we're trying to measure the absolute distance, has been so hard because you've had to literally daisy chain all these things together with all these problems. And so it's only recently that we've really begun as a community to think we've measured it to 10%. So we'll now go on to talk about some of the recent, just in the last 10 or 15 years, improvements, which have taken what's traditionally been a very controversial, chaotic, uh, disputed field, and actually started to give it something almost resembling precision. Yeah. 